I don't want to give you a didactic lecture. Uh, I don't intend to do that. Uh, what I'd like to do is advise you, counsel you, and perhaps to a little degree entertain you. Because I'm a neuropsychologist, and that's what we do. We entertain people sometimes. And uh, it's great to know that uh, Peter tonight is going to act as a volunteer. <laughs> now, if, if any of you are of a sensitive nature, you need to leave the room now, OK? <laughs> All right. Uh, but seriously, what I want... Let's go down. Sorry, Peter, it's still on the, the previous one. I'm not sure I want to help you out now. That's it, that's it, that's it. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah you okay. got it from there. Okay, good. Great. So let's just go to uh, slide. Yep. Okay, got it now. Yeah. So I'm going to talk to you about newly diagnosed epilepsy and neuropsychological sequelae. And this is an area that I've been passionate about over the last 10 to 20 years. I come from a position that's very clear. If you want to be able to uh, manage your epilepsy as well as you can, we need to give you as much advice and information as possible. But I'm working on the basis that you have to be the expert on your own epilepsy. Now, neurologists have a significant role in the clinical management of your epilepsy. They're going to diagnose it and prescribe the appropriate uh, treatment. An epilepsy nurse specialist can advise and counsel you on the risk of epilepsy. A neuropsychologist like myself can contribute to improving your understanding of the comorbidities of epilepsy. But the question mark refers to you. Because if we are going to be able to manage epilepsy well, you need to play an active role in that rather than be a recipient of it. So my position is... From the very, very start of your epilepsy career, I want to make sure that you have enough information to be able to manage your epilepsy as well as you can be. And unfortunately, that, for many of you, will not be the usual course of action. Because if, you're, if Ireland is any li anything like the UK, we're not good at advising and educating people once they've had their uh, diagnosis. So if, if we look at what you need to understand, what you need to understand from the very beginning is, how will your condition affect you? What are the treatment options available? What medication will you need to take and for how long? And what are the side effects of that medication? And what are the comorbidities? And these are the questions that should be addressed by you to your neurologist within months of your diagnosis. Not the first necessary uh, assessment of your, by your neurology, but over the next few months, you should have some idea about these areas in relation to your own epilepsy. I serve as the Secretary General of the International Bureau for Epilepsy. Um, and we are, have a very clear thought about what we want for people with epilepsy. And what we want, ideally, is for you to be ambassadors of your own condition so that you can explain to other people what epilepsy is, what type of seizures you've got, what sort of medication you take, and how your seizures are and how your seizures affect you. Um, in an ideal world, I'd like you to be able to do that and just be able to tell anybody about that aspect of the management of your condition. Why? Because the more agency you have, 
the more clarity you have about your condition, the better it's going to be for both you and your neurologists and those who treat your condition. Part of my work has been to understand the comorbidities of epilepsy. And what we mean by comorbidities uh, for this particular presentation, certainly, is about the psychological consequences, the social consequences, and the neuropsychological consequences. Now, I would need at least about uh, an hour and a half to go through all of these areas. And uh, Peter said, uh, you know, I'll be lucky if I get 10 minutes. So... I am going to just focus on the neuropsychological. And what do I mean by the neuropsychological consequences? Well, it means quite simply, I want to know how well your brain's working. I want to know how well you, uh, are you good at attention and concentration? I want to know about your memory, your speed of information processing, and your higher executive functioning. I want to know, basically, how epilepsy is impacting on that. Why do I want to know it? Not because I'm a nosy bugger, it's just because I think it will help in understanding your treatment. So let, let's, let's just take the opportunity to uh, unpack what I mean by the neuropsychological consequences. Now for this, I'm just going to demonstrate a few, a few of the tests for you. Uh, can I have a volunteer, Peter? <laughs> oh, well, very, thank you very much. That's great. Excellent. Okay. So, now... No, Peter, please have a seat. Oh, God. <laughs> this will not hurt me at all. It'll be fine. I'll be all right, OK? Um, so, normally, if I did an assessment of somebody, I would be in my own offices, the room would be very, very quiet, and there wouldn't be about 200 people watching intensely. I'm just going to demonstrate one or two of the tests just to give you an idea about the sort of things I'm thinking about. So, I always spend a lot of time relaxing uh, uh, the, the person I'm going to assess. But this is Peter, so that's not a problem, okay? <laughs> so, Peter, how are you? I'm you look a bit nervous and confused. Yeah, you look a bit nervous. <laughs> okay. I'm, you, you're going to have to trust me, Peter. Yeah, I'm going to be really gentle. Just going to take. I don't. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Peter, is that better? Yeah, I'm just going to be really gentle with you. I just want you to just to follow me, okay? And try to ignore the fact that 200-odd people are watching you, okay? Intensely. Uh, so, Peter, the first thing I want to do is just see how well your attention and concentration is. And I'm just going to ask you to perform a simple task for me. Is that all right? Okay. Yeah, that, great. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to... Um, tell you a, a, a few numbers and all I want you to do is listen carefully and just repeat them back to me okay one three one three excellent great good okay um we're going to carry on doing that and I want you to do the same thing Peter uh, one two five one two five okay carrying on one seven eight three one seven eight Eight, three. Thank you. One, nine, two, four, six. One, nine, two, four, six. One, eight, seven, three, six, five. I've, I'm already lost. Okay. All I right. know it started with one, and somewhere my brain switched off. Okay. So, and would anybody like to diagnose what type of brain damage he's got? Oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. That, that's, that's never a question. It's called exhaustion. Okay. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to carry on, and this time I'm going to ask you to repeat the questions back to me. Quick, repeat the numbers back to me in the reverse order. So, if I said to you uh, one two, you would say uh, two one. Very good. Okay. Are you ready? I know. <laughs> Seven, four, eight, three, six, five, eight. Eight. <laughs> okay, all right. I'm just joking, all right. What we know is that most people whose actual attention and concentration is intact will probably be able to recall about 
seven digits forwards and about five digits backwards or between four and six. So, so Peter's actually doing quite well. Okay. Now, Peter, I want to really uh, examine your memory in, in detail now. Okay. So I'm just going to read you a, a short story and I just want you to see how much you can remember. Okay. Are you ready? <laughs> Mary Ann reported at the police station that she had been rel- r- r- she had been robbed the night before of fifty-six pounds. She had four small children. The rent was due, and they had not eaten for two days. The police, touched by the woman's story, took up a collection for her. Can you repeat that back to me, Peter? Starting at the beginning. No, I mean I I I I, didn't, I mean I can't. I mean Mary Ann. Um, uh, her rent is due. She. Um, I, is it, this, can anybody give him a hand? No, no, I can get more. I can get more from that. But I mean, as I'm, I'm just, about, I'm just about ready to go to sleep. That's my problem here. It's been a long four, uh, four days. Okay, let's try to um, focus on the so, last bit. Then. So yeah, I know I can't. This is the thing. I mean, this is ridiculous. Um, <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so, actually, and so that that's one of the uh, stories I, I would use. But um, in in usual conditions, Peter would have slept for the last few nights quite well. <laughs> he wouldn't be observed by two hundred p- odd people who are laughing at his poor performance, uh, and he'd probably do well. And I can assure you even on the basis of that very cursory examination, uh, Peter's brain is intact. He's just a bit tired. <laughs> so that, that's what I do as a neuropsychologist. Now, why am I telling you that? Because many people with epilepsy report problems with their attention and concentration, their memory processing, their speed of information processing, their executive functioning. Um, and people with epilepsy are sometimes concerned that these impairments will get worse with time. I often have people in my clinic saying, will I develop dementia? People often attribute these deficits to their anti-epileptic drug treatment. They say, it's the drugs that are causing me to be like this, and I'm going to challenge that in a minute. And then relatively few studies have actually charted what our cognitive function is like over time. And for people with epilepsy, there are a few studies that have actually looked at what happens to your cognitive functioning over time if, if you continue to have seizures and then you're on medication or if you're not. And information on people well controlled epilepsy or newly diagnosed epilepsy is lacking. Now, of course, there are many reasons why people have cognitive problems. Even if you don't have epilepsy, you may experience cognitive problems, partly because you may have not slept the, well, the night before well. You may have had a, one or two glasses too much of wine. That's impaired your performance. You may be very tired. That impairs your performance. And you may be anxious or depressed, and that impairs your performance. All of these factors we have to take into account when we're trying to understand people's functioning. And most of, most of uh, the belief is that the, the cognitive problems are directly related to uh, the seizures and the anti-epileptic drug treatment. But I was uh, fortunate to conduct a study um, quite a number of years ago now, in 2010. And and this is a little bit of a complicated graph, but what it shows basically is that the line across the naught axis is uh, a control group, that is people without epilepsy, and the lines uh, that are patterned on there is the performance of people with epilepsy who had been diagnosed before taking anti-epileptic medication and before they'd had one or two seizures. And what that tells us as uh, neuroscientists is that 
the uh, cognitive problems that people have are already in existence at the time that you develop your epilepsy or your epilepsy starts to appear in terms of the seizures. So the structure of the brain is compromised and that, com that, that structure is the same compromise that affects your, how well your brain works. So you have to accept unfortunately that if you have epilepsy you're likely to have cognitive problems now they may not be great but they will exist and, and for me what's important is that I want you to know that at the very beginning I don't want it to come as a surprise I don't want you to say it's all about the drugs that I take it isn't it's, it's about the underlying structure that causes you have seizures in the first place and if you know that then at least you know you don't have to blame you don't blame the drugs and you know that perhaps we can do something about it so in an ideal world if you were newly diagnosed epilepsy you'd see an epileptologist very quickly the eptologist will inform you and your family about the epilepsy. There will be people there to educate you. There will be social workers to support you. You'll see a clinical psychologist. You'll have a good understanding and knowledgeable employer. There will be a, an abundance of epilepsy support organisations to, ha to help you. And you will be living in a compassionate and caring society in an ideal world. And unfortunately, there isn't an, an ideal world, and it's not one, certainly, that I'm aware of. So I think that we just have to think about, in the, in, in the face of what we have to deal with, we have to do the best we, we can. So in an ideal world, I'd like to see... Uh, I'd like everyone who has epilepsy to see someone like me within three months of being diagnosed, because I'd like to sit down with everybody, and I'd like to tell them about their epilepsy, explain to them about the, the consequence of their epilepsy, explain to them about their cognitive functioning, explain to them about their moods, so at least that you, you have a good understanding. Now, in the, U, in the UK, where we feel, feel that we probably provide fairly good services, there is one neuropsychologist to every... 8,000 people with epilepsy who might benefit. So, uh, and I, I've been uh, working in this area for 30 years and I don't think I've seen 8,000 patients yet. So I'm really rubbish, really rubbish. Um, so what we have to do is to think smart. And, and I think one way of thinking smart is that you perhaps don't need to see me. You just need to see somebody who can give you the same advice that I would give you. And epilepsy organisations, I think, have a very significant role in providing clear and reliable information about your epilepsy. And so I'm a great believer, if, you, if we can't access neuropsychological services, let's look at how we can improve your self-management. And self-management is important. It tells us how to care for our condition. It's important for uh, adopting a healthy lifestyle. It's making you aware of the safety issues and preventing accidents. And it's importantly giving you some understanding about the cause of your condition and how it might affect your health. So if you're newly diagnosed epilepsy, I'm going to tell you, you need to look after your, your brain. You need to make sure you get the right level of sleep. You need to exercise. You need to stay away from uh, excessive alcohol or or drugs that may impair your anti-epileptic drugs. You need to really concentrate on looking after yourself and looking after yourself well, because that's part of the management of your epilepsy. And you probably haven't been told that, but you need to be. You need to understand that's what you need to do. And so a healthy brain is one that is where you have a good understanding of how it works, you've got a moderate alcohol intake, you have good exercise, you have strategies for improving your cognitive functioning, you have good nutrition, you adhere to your anti-epileptic drug medication, and you make sure you get a good sleep. And you look after your mood. 
Now, there's a couple of uh, uh, already existing uh, sources of information that are very good for cognitive impairment. And this is called the, uh, there's the one the Canadian Epilepsy Alliance has produced that tells you all about the cognitive problems that you might experience. And that would be, that would be really good to understand how that works for you. And you can look, they, they'll give you strategies for ameliorating some of your cognitive problems. And hobscotch is an American uh, uh, an American methodology that they've used. Again, it's for self-management. You go on the website, you download it. They give you some strategies and exercises. And I would, you know, recommend this one as really important if you wanted to do something about your cognitive impairment. And it's, it's good to keep your brain uh, active and functioning. So there's a whole range of them, but it's important to try and identify ones that are really useful. And the self-management programmes on this slide are ones that have been tested out uh, with people with epilepsy and appear to, to work quite well. So again, I'm emphasising that you have to do this. It's not going to be done for you. You have to take the initiative to do this. My own uh, charity that I've been involved in Epilepsy Action has got a, some great w web pages on how to deal with uh, leading a, a healthy lifestyle if you have epilepsy. And, you know, if you, do, if you only do one thing tonight, go home and think, how can I work better with my epilepsy? How can I make things better for myself? We're working on a programme of research to try and look at interventions because, unfortunately, despite the fact that we know epilepsy is associated with cognitive functioning, there isn't a programme of intervention studies for newly diagnosed epilepsy. But I'm going to try and change that before I retire. I'm going to try and make sure that there is a programme and that programme gets used. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank Peter. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, my apologies for my performance there, Professor <laughs> Baker. But at least I know how to spell the word brain. <laughs> I don't, I'm, I'm really not sure if we can trust a neuropsychologist who can't spell the word brain. But anyway. Revenge. That was deliberate. <laughs> Yep. Um, are cognitive deficits mostly as a result of development or because of damage caused by epilepsy? Sorry, can you say that again? So, are cognitive deficits mostly as a result of development or because of damage caused by epilepsy? It's the underlying... Sorry. Yeah, it's the underlying structure that causes you have seizures that also causes the cognitive problems. In, in some patients who have very, very chronic seizures, yes, that might add to the picture. Anti-epileptic drugs may have a sedative effect, but the majority of them don't uh, actually confer further cognitive impairment. Uh, somebody apparently thinks you're a renowned, uh, you're a renowned author on a subject of fetal valpro spectrum disorder. Um, um, uh, uh, which I know you are, obviously, but um, do you know of any children impacted with FASD, fetal valve, sorry, fetal valve spectrum disorder, who went on to develop epilepsy? That's a, an exceptionally good question, and the answer is we don't have information on that which is reliable and valid at this stage. Uh, I spent uh, 15 years as the principal investigator in the UK on uh, exposure to sodium valproate, uh, and we tested over 600 children uh, from birth, looking uh, at their development over six years. Um, to actually take uh, our time beyond that uh, is, is really time-consuming. But I left the work in the hands of uh, Dr. Uh, Bromley, who is now uh, continuing that, that line of work. But uh, I do not believe that there is a significant evidence that uh, children born to mothers taking sodium valproate go on to necessarily be at risk of developing epilepsy, apart from the usual genetics 
that are outside the influence of the sodium valproate. 